and welcome. My name's Andy. Thanks for joining us for this um, this next flipped preaching video. Um, this is for the. It's intended to prepare you for um, Sunday, the fourth of February, the next celebration service that we have, which is at Peel. Um, if you're one of the local people, um, you've probably heard, but we're trying out a new park and ride system because. Um, as you know, parking is a bit tight around the, the church. So if you want to try out the park and ride system, that would be great. Give that, give that a go and let me know how, how we get on. Okay, so the passage that we're going to be looking at that week, I should mention as well, this is a, um, we're going to be welcoming Tim Grass, who's going to talk to us about the exhibition, the art exhibition, the awakening exhibition, and how, and how we can get involved in that. Okay, so uh, the passage we're going to be looking at on Sunday, and therefore thinking about in advance, is Mark 1, 29-39. It follows on from the last week's one and the one before that. So, if you remember, Jesus had called the disciples to follow him. They leave everything behind. He straight away leads them into the synagogue, and there was the episode last week. Um, when he was confronting the scribes, um, teaching with an authority that they'd never dreamt of before, and suddenly this evil spirit manifests itself, and Jesus um, tells the evil spirit to be quiet, come out, and he does. So Jesus is confronted evil straight away. And then this passage follows. If you haven't read it, go and have a look now. There'll be a link in the, the, the text below, but it's uh, say, as I say, Mark 1, 29 to 39. Okay, um, in, in these videos, building up to the Awakening Art Exhibition, where we have the Methodist Modern Art Collection coming to the island, um, I'm highlighting a picture which I think helps to, um, helps to expand on the, the passage. So this week we can have a look at this picture here. Um, it's by an artist called John Riley painted sometime in the 1960s and its title, it's an unfortunate title and apparently the Methodist art collection custodians did ask him if he would consider changing the name but he apparently, apparently the artist died um, just before we sent the request. Anyway, the title is The Healing of the Lunatic Boy. Um, back then the word lunatic didn't cause problems but today you know we it's not a word that we would use anyway the healing of the the lunatic boy take the title with a pinch of salt um, and it's not quite this the passage that we're going to look at today but it's similar enough um, we've got two distinct parts to the painting there's a there's a part over on the right where we see this boy frothing and writhing seems to be trapped in this grey kind of cocoon. There are two people trying to help him. We don't know if they're disciples or his parents, but they're also trapped in this grey. And it's a sort of writhing, getting nowhere. But then Jesus, on the other side of the picture, very calmly places his hand above the boy who's healed, and there's this um, shaft of light illuminating them both. So in the passage for Sunday, um, it's got three distinct episodes. So I want to just share a little thought about each of these three distinct bits. First, Jesus goes back to Simon's house, Simon and Andrew's house, James and John come along too, and Simon's mother-in-law was there and she was, um, she was fevered, she had a fever. Um, and Jesus takes her hand, the fever leaves, and she raised, it says that he raised her. Um, he raised her, taking the hand, and left her the fever. Now, you could think of that as just being he literally stood her up, but the word raised is the same word we used when Jesus was raised from the dead. There's a real sense of a resurrection, a new creation, something new being made here. Um, the fever has no part in this new kingdom, only health and wholeness in this new kingdom. And it says then that she served them. She began to serve. Um, 
the Greek word there is diakonē, where we get our word deacon from. So, as well as Jesus calling the, the disciples who were all male, he very quickly attracted a band of women who also followed him and helped and were part of his clan. We hear less of them. Um, Luke's Gospel has more about them, but don't, don't feel that this is a male thing. The, the 12 disciples were men, but he had a group of women who also followed and were just as part in his inner circle. Um, in a way, he was kind of fonder of them than he was of the male ones. Okay, then, it says, the evening came, the sun set, which meant that the Sabbath was over and people could start work again. People could start going out and going about their daily business. And it says that all the ones with, the Ill with illness and the demon possessed came. Um, it said the whole city gathered at the door, which is probably a bit of an exaggeration, but it meant that this was a universal thing. This was everybody came and he cast out the demons and he healed the diseases. Just a couple of lines, but it's a sense that the new creation has come. These people were healed. They were, um, whatever was wrong, Jesus managed to, to give them what they needed. And it was the, the poor and the needy were the ones who flocked to his door. Great, great passage. The, the reading finishes with a, a strange bit. It says that early at night, Jesus went out to a desolate place and he was there praying. Jesus, in the midst of all this excitement and doing what he was meant to be doing, bringing the new kingdom, Jesus had to go off and spend some time on his own and to pray. I, I don't know whether you would consider yourself an introvert or an extrovert. Um, I think it's interesting to know which you are. Um, and it, it's often defined by the way that you recharge your batteries. We've all got emotional and, um, not spiritual, but we've got emotional batteries that get worn down by, by the things that we do. Um, and some people, typically just over half of the population, we think, are extrovert, which means that your batteries get recharged by being in the company of others. So going out with some friends, talking about it, um, that's what recharges your battery. Uh, just under half, the other, the other fraction, are introverts, and they recharge their batteries by being alone and in social situations, the energy drops and drops and drops and drops and drops, and they need time on their own to process and put things back so they can build up their energy ready to go on another day. And I wonder if that's a little bit of what's going on with Jesus here. He just, in the midst of all the excitement, he had to take himself away for a bit. I think it's interesting. Remember, Jesus had just called the disciples to follow him. And here they do something quite different. It said, and hunted him, Simon, and, uh, and those with him. Um, Sometimes we would translate that as Simon searched after him or Simon looked for him. But the word really is hunted him in a, in a hunting animals kind of way. We've got a glimpse here of a bit of tension um, between the disciples and Jesus, perhaps, that Jesus wanted to be on his own, but the disciples said, no, you can't be on your own, we've got work to do. Um, interesting shift in the, in, the, in the relationship. But Jesus said, let's go elsewhere so that I may preach, for this is why I came. There's a whole, all through Jesus' work, there's this um, tension between doing stuff in public and being alone in private, and he manages to get the balance right. And that's, that's something for us, therefore, to think about too. How do we manage to, um, to have quiet time on our own to recharge our batteries? And how do we balance that with the pressing concerns that are on us? It's something that I personally um, have to work at. Um, this, this work as a minister is brilliant. I love it. Um, but I need to make sure that I don't, my batteries don't drain, that I don't get too burnt out. So I do need to find time when I can just rest and recuperate because that's good for everybody. Okay, um, 
I hope that's given you some things to, to chew over and think through. If you meet in a small group, perhaps you want to talk about this before Sunday. Um, there's a, on the, jot, jot down on a bit of paper your notes and feelings about this, see how, see how the Spirit guides you. And we'll come together as a, as a joint congregation, all four congregations, for what I hope will be a brilliant celebration, United Service, next Sunday. Um, if you're watching this and you're nowhere near, then of course you're welcome. It's lovely to have you with you, but we won't see you next Sunday. Okay, thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye.